Every day, you essentially pay your dues by doing the harder thing when it's the right thing to do. Here we are again, Mr. Scott Wilgris. How are you, my friend? I'm doing really well, Dave. How about you? That's good, man. This is your, uh, I was actually looking at some research. This is the trifecta completed. You're the third, third returning uh, episode here. We had you by yourself. And then I forgot that you were on here with Tim Gabbett, which was a sick episode. And then uh, here we are for number three. I kind of forgot about the Tim Gabbett episode myself. <laughs> it's because it was happening during Sorry, like, Tim. <laughs> the purgatory of the middle of COVID where I was, oh, yeah. uh, I was stuck in a hotel room for like a seven day quarantine or 14 day mm. quarantine in my hometown. So that's probably why I, I remember that, that yeah. my memory. <laughs> Not, not that we could ever forget Tim because he's obviously iconic, but that exactly. was, uh, I, I felt like I did that episode selfishly just to have another episode to talk with Tim and learn, you know, for sure. Um, but since then, I mean, obviously we have some cool, exciting developments in your world, but I know one of them. But what uh, what is new in the last two years since we've spoke with you? Oh, wow. In the last two years. Yeah, I think uh, probably since we last spoke, my involvement with work-wise anyway, my involvement with the women's artistic gymnastics team for Team Canada has actually grown a fair bit. Nice. Um, I've been more involved in camps. I've been more involved in programming for uh, various athletes spread across the country. And, uh, you know, I think the last time we spoke was before the Olympics, before the, right. the Tokyo Olympics. So yeah. I actually went to the Olympics as a staff member with Softball Canada. Um, and we were lucky enough to, the, the team was, uh, was able to bring home a bronze medal, which nice. was one of the goals for sure. So we, that was a great experience. It was a really different experience, I'm sure, than most Olympic experiences would be, mm -hmm. you know, being in a kind of a, essentially a bubble in COVID or in uh, Tokyo. Uh, but that was great. And, you know, it, it was really, really cool too, to be able to see a lot of the athletes that I work with at home on a regular basis, including Ellie and, and the rest of the women's team, um, the canoe kayak sprint athletes that I work with on a regular basis at home. You know, seeing all of them in the village and, you know, just being able to share that experience, um, yep. even though I was there uh, as a staff member for Softball Canada. So that was yep. really neat. Awesome. And I think that your experience with more involvement inside Gymnastics Canada and artistic gymnastics is very much reflective of what's happening on the bigger scale. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, right? Because obviously, I think, you know, you've been with Ellie and you've been with, you know, working in gymnastics for what, 12 years at least, I think, like somewhere in there last time we spoke. But that's it's definitely not... Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, it's essentially since 2011 uh, is when Ellie and I started working together. So yeah, it's, I guess it's going to be 12 years at some point this season, this year. Yeah, and that's crazy, right? Because that is definitely not the experience of most people in gymnastics, which is, I think, in my experience, it's been 10 years that I've kind of been in the trenches doing stuff. And I, I think the first five years were very much running uphill, you know, and I think it's only been the last five years, maybe four years that I feel like people have moved from the narrative of like, we're definitely not doing a mixed program. We're definitely not doing training. We're definitely not doing that to this is curiosity to now where I think we're at, we're like, well, this is actually really useful. And um, people are actively seeking out the services of strength coaches or are willing to do a summer program that's mixed. And so what has your experience been the last maybe 10 years looking at the landscape change? I think I'm, I could echo exactly what you're saying. I've gone through, or I've seen that in the, in the, you know, the national um, landscape for sure. Uh, you know, starting out, it, I was, really fortunate to be involved early on in Ellie's career and her, her coaching staff here in Halifax, um, having gone through some, you know, sports science and strength conditioning themselves uh, as, as athletes, Dave Kikuchi being one of them. So, you know, they were really open um, to trying things out at, at that point in time. And, you know, since then, I've, I've kind of like been getting closer and closer to becoming more involved uh, nationally, or I was getting more and more um, involved nationally, but I was definitely getting a lot more roadblocks. I'd say four years, four or five years ago, when I first started to, you know, go to camps and speak to national team coaches, or sorry, club coaches of national team athletes. Now I, I find that it's they, they will approach me probably before I'll necessarily approach them. They'll they'll have curiosities around, you know, what have you been doing with Ellie? How can we apply that to our mm -hmm. setting? This is this is you know our situation, and I think it's it's really indicative of of you know probably some of the success that, that um, Ellie has seen on, in, on the national scale and in, in, uh, international scale uh, when it comes to the Canadian coaches, but also, you know, po uh, podcasts and resources like the stuff that you're doing here with shift and the, the symposium last summer is, you know, the word spreading and it's, uh, mm. and it's a really exciting time, I think for, for gymnastics in that sense. Yeah. That's so cool to hear. And I, I agree with you. I think it's, it's fun to see, 
you know, I think people like yourself and me and maybe Nick and many others I could name are really like in the dirt, head down in the trenches. And so every so often you pop your head up and you get a little bit of the gauge of the temperature and you see like, whoa, this is this is really cool. You know, I think a lot of the movement here in the States has been the collegiate level, you know, summer videos, a lot of social media goes out seeing the girls lifting and trap bar deadlifting and doing other stuff along with their traditional gymnastics stuff. And that's really exciting for people. And I think also it's a hat tip to you, which is something I see as a pattern everywhere else, which is you approach that as, you know, working with those athletes, you know, one is a good human, which is important, right? You're just like kind and you're willing to learn and, and teach them, but also share more of your experiences. Um, but also it's like, obviously, Obviously, there's some some solid results that are driven from either what Ellie's done or when they start to dabble a little bit, you're willing to kind of help them see, oh my God, they're running a little faster or they're jumping a little higher or their knees feel a bit better along throughout the season. But also too, is that I think the dance has to be between offering a very new conceptual framework for how to do gymnastics, physical preparation, but not forcing it or removing completely the gymnastics side of things. And I think, you know, that's the error that I have made and others have maybe made is like you swing that pendulum so hard that you say like, we're going to lift and forget about all the rope climbs and handstands, but it, that's obviously not your experience. And that's probably why you're sticking. You know what I mean? I think you're completely right. And I think on, our, on the last podcast now, it's again, a couple of years ago now, but we talked a little bit about some of the errors that either I made or I've seen other strength coaches yeah. make that have, that have maybe put up some guards from some coaches. And yeah. a lot of that is, like you said, going too too heavy, too fast, too all in, too fast. Yeah. Um, and not understanding this hybrid has to be the way to go. I mean, the, the sport is still gymnastics. It's not mm -hmm. Olympic lifting or it's not weightlifting or powerlifting. Um, so, you know, keeping that in mind and just knowing that this is a supplementary uh, piece of the puzzle that's meant to, you know, help with performance, help with longevity, help uh, keep people healthy. Um, having that in mind, I think is the way to, is the way to go. And, and, you know, for me personally, I, I think I've maybe said this before, but um, not coming from a gymnastics background myself, it's really easy to keep that beginner's mindset. It's mm. really easy to, you know, not going in thinking that I know everything because I know I don't. Mm. Uh, so, you know, learning from the, the sport coaches and learning from people like yourself who have, you know, a bit of a both, both of ends of the spectrum, um, you know, keeps me keeps me growing and keeps me hungry for for, you know, new information and stuff like that on a regular basis. Yeah, that's awesome to hear. And it's cool to see someone like yourself who just continues to see not only your own growth, but also you continue to innovate and, and think about new ideas and learn as I think the years go by. And that's, you know, definitely how I try to approach it, which is like, I have a, you know, a set principle, I think some things are always going to stick around that are good. But like, I read new stuff all the time. I change my ideas. I meet new athletes that are not really fitting what I think is the best way to approach things. And uh, it's cool because it's a blessing and a curse being, I guess, tip of the spear, which is you don't have a reference manual. I can't go on PubMed and look up a bunch of really good programming studies for gymnastics. But at the same time, it allows us at Champion in particular to have a data set of like, we had like 15 college girls home with us last summer between rehab and uh, strength conditioning. So we know a lot of really good counter movement jump data. No, we, we see a lot of really good hop testing. We know what, what exercises seem to make a sprint test go up, which makes them run faster on vault. And we see some girls in their junior or senior university year who typically are like in shambles. They're like, this is the best gymnastics I've ever done. I feel amazing. I, I'm not hurt for the first time ever. I'm learning new skills. And it's like, man, that's awesome to see such an upward uh, momentum. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And I mean, it might segue a little bit into our next, um, our next topic, but the, yeah. uh, just looking at a, a lot of the athletes that I have worked with over the last few years, you know, some of the early adopters when I started to do national team stuff, you know, watching the success that they were able to have this last fall, um, and, or winter was, was really, really exciting mm. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. So I think I'm seeing the same thing. And, and some of those athletes are ones that had left almost left the sport or were really close to leaving the sport for various reasons some of those being injury um but for them to come to to have them come back and, and see them you know have success and just how excited they are uh to do gymnastics again is really really reinvigorating like on a regular on a regular basis. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and i think this is a really good place to segue like you said which is i still think for a lot of people they're entering our world a little mm -hmm. bit intimidated right because i think your experience and in, in mine maybe studying and stuff it, we have a large bank of knowledge to go from and it's easy for us to see patterns or build a program on a whiteboard real quick and kind of be like yeah this is a good place to start but i think the average gymnastics coach and the average you know gymnast or the average strength coach who wants to get into this is still very much overwhelmed with the the amount of blank canvas that is available and so i think that's like the first thing i want to start with which is what what do you what have you seen or what do you feel are probably some of the most prominent benefits over you know we're not just talking about a four-week cycle but maybe over years when someone is really pot committed to do this for the long term like what, what are the kind of big prominent things that you see are, are beneficial Whew, i mean that's a loaded question i could probably go on for a while i mean so 
the last time we talked, I had just started working with a pretty new to me mm-hmm. g- gymnastics athlete who was a four year NCAA athlete. She um, is from another province in Canada, moved during the early pandemic, like the first summer of uh, summer of 2020 to train with Ellie and, and her coach, Dave. Mm-hmm. And uh, her she she had never been on a she'd never been on a senior national team before, never been to an international competition for Canada. Um, but was like I said, a four-year NCAA gymnast, so had a you know a pretty good experience level. And from what I understand, they did a they did a weights program there. It didn't seem like it was really well supervised or maybe really well connected to gymnastics in any sense. Um, so I, I it's funny because I would I would have sent out programs to athletes and and you know be able to see them from afar uh, leading up to this. But this was one of the first times that I got to do the program that I wanted to see um, for like a relatively new but mature in terms of you know chronological age athlete um, in the weight room Uh, Mm. she started at the age of 22 so you know I got to do um, really consistent monitoring uh, in terms of counter movement jumps and uh, sprint testing and isometric mid thigh pulse of strength testing with this Mm. athlete and kind of watch how the progression went over a basically an 18 month period leading up to this last world championships. Um, and again, when she started, uh, she hadn't, like I said, hadn't been to an international competition. Uh, and the goal was for her to make first, the goal was for her to make the national team, then to be carded, uh, for, for, you know, funding. And then the next goal (laughs) was, was to make a world championship team. And, Mm. So I think like when when she first started, you know, I didn't really know what to expect based on you know her experience level because she was a quite an experienced high level um, athlete to to start with. But well, the first thing I noticed was she didn't know how to run. She wasn't very fast, and she was not strong. Like she could. If not. you're listening, this is said with love. If you know who this it is, is. <laughs> she, she, Danelle might listen, and she knows she knows these things. Um, but she, so she wasn't strong. She was very nervous around heavy weights. She had some bad experiences in the past with whether it's, you know, a safety bar being on backwards and falling off of, off of her or, or, you know, she's had, she had some, so she wasn't, she was timid around heavy weights. And so we, we took a pretty slow, um, approach to the problem. And I think, you know, this is maybe what you're asking is, you know, with, with an athletes who are not experienced in this area, really, really simple stuff, like getting stronger, lifting, you know, getting slowly, getting more comfortable lifting heavy weights and getting some absolute strength or relative strength is going to be one of the key things. Uh, And then sprint, like whether it's sprint technique and mechanics or just sprinting, you know, doing, starting with, starting with the technique side of things, moving into maybe some heavy weighted or not heavy, but moderately weighted um, sled sprints, and then moving into more, you know, uh, more, more, body weight sprinting stuff over a period of a year or whatever it is to to really improve the speed so speed strength would be the first two things that i think we have um really noticeable impacts on in with with doing a or a, a consistent strength conditioning program mm. uh there some of the side effects i guess or the not side effects but the um you know other things that are great that come along with that we saw a change in body composition to, uh, you know, much more muscle mass, adding muscle mass. Uh, mm. She was a she's a pretty lean, like slight athlete to begin with, but a little bit of muscle mass that she added, um, you know, she felt she felt great about it. She thought mm. that, um, you know, this is going to be kind of like my armor, like my bulletproof armor uh-huh, to, to help her avoid, you love know, that. some of the injuries that she might have faced in the in the past. And and I think that. You know, the, that first Christmas after she went home, <laughs> she came back saying, you know, my parents noticed like, man, you're so you're so jacked these days. And <laughs> so it was uh, it was that was a kind of a cool um, unintended side effect. But, you know, there was no change in um, no change. There was actually improvements in speed, improvements in power, improvements in jump mm. height and, and all that, that kind of stuff right away. So that was that was really cool. And like I said, along with these improvements in strength, because the deficit for this particular athlete happened to be strength at the time um, we saw collateral improvements in in power in jump height mm. in explosiveness like contact right. time type stuff so you know all those things kind of steadily rose over the first year of training but we you know we didn't try to jump right into power knowing you know obviously that's our our intended goal eventually mm. um, that was a you know like I said a year maybe 18 month process mm. and, and you know got to a point where you know, she was then, uh, you know, one of the top, one of the highest uh, jumping athletes. Not that that's necessarily a, 
a thing, but it's, you know, it's cool to see uh, athletes on the, on the national team. So that was cool. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I love that you're describing this because what comes to my mind is I feel like the people listening to this podcast will be like, you know, very high level athlete, you know, maybe is easy for them to see really big improvement gains because they're working super hard. They have resources, they have you, they have a time commitment where they're able to do it. And I think the important thing to kind of highlight there is that, yes, while you already have a really high level athlete who is maybe mentally committed and is really willing to go the extra mile, maybe it's because the collateral of what they've seen happen with Ellie. I think that's on the opposite side of that is that when you have somebody with an extremely high training age in a sport, you tell it's sometimes really hard to kind of get more performance jumps like that, like to see substantial progress in someone's jump height or sprint or stuff like that. When they've trained so much their whole life, it's really hard to squeeze out more than a half a percent in performance, you know, on that side. So that means that for the, I would say the average person listening, who's going to be more the audience, which is the everyday compulsory coach, the everyday optional coach, they're maybe, maybe even recreational and they're just working in optional or collegiate level gymnastics you have to realize that there's a huge potential upside if it's done well because you have an athlete who probably has a lot more possible benefit because they're not as highly trained or they don't have a training age in the weight room at all and i think that for me is really exciting because concepts are slowly getting to where we're like okay we can do this but then people are like not actually still doing a full program and if they were able to get a little bit more information they would see just enormous benefits for those things. Same things you talked about, whether it's sprinting speed for vault or, um, you know, jump, jump, uh, I guess, uh, acceptance of force for, for landing mechanics and not having injuries there. But people also forget that like power is inclusive of upper body power. So those kids that really mm -hmm. struggle on bars to, to tap or to kip or to do giants or higher level dismounts, upper body power is something that's also trained a lot. So I think that's just really cool for me to hear, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's funny too, like I think you guys, you probably know, and maybe some of the listeners would, would know that this uh, last season, Ellie and Danelle actually both had uh, bars skills named after them. Yeah. So there's now the Pedrick and the Black are both out there. And yeah, I think <laughs> that's more of a testament to their hard work in the in the gym and Dave's <laughs> Dave's and their creativity. But you know, that's all there's there's a lot of supporting stuff that we try to do in here, knowing that they're gonna be trying these skills that are higher level, yeah. higher difficulty to make sure that the shoulders are bulletproof and the <laughs> and all that kind of stuff, along with their obviously their physio uh, team. So yeah, no, it's been a it's been a fun year for sure. Yeah. And also um, something I did want to share that I'm not going to go into specifics of like what team and what country and stuff like that, but we were able to kind of gather some information from the higher level coaches, the national and kind of the up and coming developmental coaches about like, just asking them like, what are your thoughts on weight training and what are your thoughts on Jim is doing this in a hybrid program? And I mean, these, these coaches are, are legit, right? Like gold medals, multiple in their pockets. And so my fear was that the responses would come back, which is like, it's a waste of time. It's going to cause injuries. It's going to, uh, negatively affect body mass composition so that's a, it would it would make skills more difficult and i was pleasantly surprised that uh, many of them actually do believe that it's beneficial and it seems to be the barrier is education for what to do with such limited time and also um, equipment you know they're not really familiar with like what types of apparatus or apparatus is that a word did i just make a word up um it sounds like a, a plural octopus so it's probably right <laughs> we always joke about like menisci is it a menisci anyways um we, we uh they essentially said like we, there's a lot of tools that are out there between barbells, kettlebells, dumbbells, head balls, whatever. And if we just knew what was the most effective use of 45 minutes when you have 30 hours or 25 hours that are already really maxed out and how do we use those in a great program over the year, we'd be more open to do it. And for me, that was mind blowing, right? Cause I was like, I really thought, you know, definitely five years ago when you surveyed maybe a similar pack of coaches going to cause injuries, waste of time, not going to, not going to be helpful for skills. And uh, it's cool. It's really cool to see the transition in, my, in mindset there. Absolutely. I think it's, it's huge. And, you know, this, uh, we haven't really, we haven't really broached this subject yet, but I mean, this past year, um, the, the Canadian team made history by having finishing uh, third place on the, in the team event at world championships it was the first time Ooh. a Canadian team has ever won a, won a medal in the team event at world championships, which, you know, was really cool to watch from a, from a distance and, you know, be in contact with Ellie Danelle and a few of the other coaches and athletes that were there. But, you know, of the five ladies who stood on the podium at the end of the day, uh, four of them had have been involved in very serious like multiple year wow. strength conditioning programs either led by myself or by you know one of my colleagues in in another province and you know seeing that and just and understand i i think it's really sinking in across the board like it, it's it, awesome man. and these are all these were all women in their you know early to mid 20s so, you know we're not talking about right. uh, the, the, the one that hasn't been involved is 16 she's pretty new to the to the scene and so I think, you know, she and I had communication with her coach almost immediately after um, Worlds to talk about, you know, starting uh, a similar program or a similar yep. um, path for, for her. So I think, you know, overall, like you said, 
people are open, uh, the, the doors are opening and, you know, people who get in the doors, I, I hope, um, you know, can take some of the lessons that we've, <laughs> that we've learned and are, are sharing to uh, help, uh, help make sure that there's, you know, less bumps on the road than maybe we experienced. Yeah. And along with like the big picture, I think it's really cool to hear all that. And I, I appreciate you being able to share that. But I think for, for most people, they kind of still sit on the on the podium right now, which is like, almost like, okay, this sounds dope. And kind of like, okay, now what, you know what I mean? Like, what's what do I do as the average person? So that's where I'd kind of like to take the conversation next, which is, you know, we know in the world of strength, conditioning and gymnastics, there's kind of levels to planning, right, which is called periodization sometimes, but essentially, you take your year or your multi year, but we won't go there. But like, you take your year and you chunk that down into like, smaller three month chunks, and then you work your way down all the way to a specific workout. So I'd like to kind of just uh, maybe pull on the thread of what you and I and others seem to be uh, finding helpful. And I can kind of talk from the collegiate programs I've consulted with and also making a lot of programs and working with the elite programs here. But I'd like to maybe just share some practical advice for like, let's start with like, maybe looking at a year, you know, and then working our way all the way down to like what movements we find are the most helpful. Um, and maybe that will offer some people some some small nuggets to chew on. So just from the, the a year, a year approach, how do you approach, you know, starting from an off season or something like that? Well, it's actually a really timely question because I'm doing that right now, <laughs> basically with, nice. yeah, like we're trying to, and this, again, this is national team uh, stuff. So it's mostly elite based um, uh, athletes and things like that, that, that we're talking about, but, uh, um, but I think it still applies. Right. So we, I would go to the ma most, the major competition of the year. That's, you know, kind of the end um, peak competition of the season. And I would kind of plan back from there. So the first, you know, that competition for a lot of the athletes that I'm programming for right now would be uh, would be World Championships, which is in late September, I believe this uh, in 2023. Mm -hmm. So I, I would start in late September and I'd work back, you know, how many weeks do we have? Right. And then I'd start to I'd plug in the, you know, maybe lower level, but still important competitions, whether that's from a, um, you know, team qualification standpoint or, you know, athlete points or whatever that is. Plug those in just to kind of see, you know, okay, these are some maybe not peaks, but these are area, things that we have to think about when we're mm -hmm. when we're planning. And, you know, that might you talked about the three month chunks. Those are usually our, our macro cycles, as I would usually call them. Yep. Um, so we would we would try to end, you know, a macro cycle on one of those smaller competitions. So, you know, yep. in, in Canada, the next competition that's coming up is actually very soon. It's it's elite Canada's in um, in a two to two weeks or something along those lines which a lot of our our elite girls are going to be uh, competing in so you know after that competition is done we're going to kind of restart our periodization to lead us into you know september and october um so from there we kind of look at you know what's the next okay so canadian championships are in may um that's going to be something that we want you know everyone to be able to show really well at so that from january to may that five month block is probably gonna be our first macro cycle mm. um so within there, I would break that up into usually what I what the term we would use is mesocycles. So more like three, four, five week blocks, depending on what else is involved there. And you might see, you know, for different athletes, some smaller competitions or or maybe you know whether it's mock meets at their clubs or you know provincial level things that they have to do within that. So that's kind of maybe where we would bookend our our mesocycles right. to line up with the end of that competition. Yep. Um, <clears throat> so now again, we're looking at the macro cycle between. Uh, essentially now in May, uh, or sorry, January and May, which is around four or five months, right? Depending on where, we, where we're cutting it off, breaking it up into mesocycles. And then I'm going to start to look at, you know, how long, like what are the stepping stones that we can take to get to our ultimate goal, which mm. is usually, you know, speed and power or right. reactive strength, like, you, right. you know, the ability to pop and stuff like that. So depending on the athlete, and especially if I'm looking at relatively new to weight training, not necessarily, um, you know, new to gymnastics or new to sports uh, or anything like that, but relatively yep. new uh, to weight training, I'm going to try to take my time and I'm not going to go right into heavy weights or I'm not going to go right into explosive power right off the bat. Um, I'm going to look at what the base of that is. And for me, the base of that, and I, I think I presented this concept um in at the at the shift symposium last summer yep. but it was uh essentially the, the base of of those speed and power things for me are, are strength um now to for me to like to to actually want to load athletes to to do maximal strength type training i need at least you know six or eight weeks of lead up to get them to a point where they can handle the heavy loads so you know we usually have a phase or two um and by phase i mean mesocycle if i want to keep the same terminology going yep um, where it's, you know, high, a little bit higher reps, um, lower weight, uh, build some, you know, tissue 
tolerability to, to loading and that kind of stuff, some movement patterning. So what teaching them to squat, teaching them to hip hinge, deadlift again, like maybe they haven't done it for a bit if, it, if they're older athletes or maybe they've never done it if they're newer athletes to the gym. Um, so that first phase, you know, the first four weeks might be, <clears throat> you know, three sets of, am I going into too much detail too quick? Here? No, no, okay. no, no. That's good. Yeah. I, I guess let's, let's go down to the, you're, you're doing exactly what I want, but I want to just Rosetta Stone and translate this to an American uh, college and club system. So people uh, yeah. in the, the non-elite world can do it. So yeah, let's, let's just pause for a second. Cause I can echo that I do the exact same thing and I would recommend the same thing, which is in the, in the States here, or if you're working in club, you're probably looking towards uh, like April, May is kind of when their biggest competition is. And if we worked back into, you know, your macro cycles, you're going to have three month chunks probably of like an in-season B backwards from that's an in-season A, which is like January, February, March, a mm -hmm. pre-season, which is like September, October, November, and then the off season of the summer here in the States. So the same thing that would happen on an elite calendar is what we recommend to all the coaches that we work with at the club level or the college level. And so yeah. we would do the same thing, which mm -hmm. is year and then backtrack three month chunks. And then from there we would backtrack, okay, we have one month or three to five weeks of a mesocycle, like you said. So yeah. it's the same thing, whether you're literally working in compulsory and your kids will come two days per week and you're going to do 15 minutes of weight training introduction, or mm -hmm. it's going to be two a day international elite, you know, they have unlimited uh, extra hours to work on there. So yeah, yeah, I just wanted to point that out, but keep going, please. Yeah. So, so I think the, the, the key thing here is, is splitting, is finding those competitions, splitting the season up into, you know, manageable chunks based on those competitions as bookends. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then from there splitting uh, those chunks up into, uh, into, into again, smaller ones like those mesocycles with, with yep. specific goals for each of those mesocycles. And, you know, it's usually stepping stones for each other. So, you know, if we have, uh, if we have our early, uh, our, our early off season work, being generally higher reps, lower weight, you know, more time under tension type stuff. That's going to move into, you know, moderate load. You know, this is maybe our like eight to 12 rep type stuff that we're going to um, do for again, three or four, um, three or four, maybe even five weeks, depending uh, before we start to get to our actual maximal strength type training, um, which now is maybe in the like three to six reps of, of relatively heavy weight. But again, you've, you've now lifted for eight to 10 weeks, probably on a hopefully regular basis before you're starting to lift heavy. And so that that's essentially three to mm. maybe four months of programming. That's just, you know, it's not very specific to, to gymnastics. It's more getting ready to load and getting ready to be specific. So that's usually what we're going to call the general prep uh, mm -hmm. phase of training, yep. um, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, absolutely does. And I think the the one I want to kind of highlight here is that the one thing I think people always maybe jump to conclusions on when they hear us talk or other people talk, which is that even if we're doing, say, two days per week uh, of lifting in a, in a general program like this, we're still doing da like almost daily and or every other day gymnastics specific training. And so I think at this point, I can safely say uh, the general approach to this, which I think works, is if you have someone who's coming five days per week or six days per week, one to two lifting sessions and then one to two gymnastics specific sessions and then maybe one day of like a lighter day with like prehab or mobility work or stuff and then maybe one accessory day if you want stuff that generally seems to be super effective and i think that's something that i also was very clear about with the international elite coaches that i was able to talk with i was like listen you might think that i'm going to come in here and say don't do gymnastics stuff but actually every day i want you to do something so maybe in a warm-up or in basics or in events or whatever you're going to have daily core work and daily shaping every single day on the events and also in your warm-up and then some other side work but then also i think the most we've ever given and, and correct me if i'm wrong if you guys do more than two but all the college girls all the elite girls all the really high level training girls the maximum is two days of training in the off season com compiled with two two days of gymnastic specific handstands, rope climbs, leg lifts, like all the stuff that you would need to do. And it's hard on both days, but it's four real days of, of, of training two and two, and it kind of funnels more to gymnastics as the year goes on. So I feel like that's the approach that I've always recommended. And if someone has two days per week with a younger compulsory group, they only come two days a week for five hours. One of those days is gymnastic specific. One of those days is general uh, weight training type stuff like that. And they still do tons of extra stuff on the side. Yeah, I mean, we, I, I've, there's been periods of time where we've done three kind of strength conditioning based days, um, but it's u usually two. And yep. the other, the other times when maybe there's been a little bit more is when I've, I've, a coach has asked me to sort of mix in more and mix in more of the uh, strength conditioning stuff into, um, you know, their normal rotation. So whether that's, you know, put some speed into the vault rotation. So instead right. of doing actual vaulting, we're going to do speed prep, like an extended, yeah. extended warm up, extended speed work and that kind of stuff in the gymnastics uh, in, in the, in the gym. 
and that that would pretty much be the only other the only time when I would say there's been more than three times a week that I've kind of programmed for uh, for gymnasts. Yeah, and just to kind of make it crystal clear of, of kind of visualizing this map is like, okay, you're going to take your year. What is the hardest competition or the thing you're going to train the most for? And then you're going to work backwards and maybe plot those more sub-important meets along the way. So in the club season, there's probably six to eight other meets. There's probably two or three of those that are really big meets you want to do well for. But then you have a year in review. You're like, okay, here's the big long year, and then I'm going to chop that up into three-month you know, in season one, in season two, and then preseason, then the off season. And that's how you work your way forward down the line, looking at what you're doing. And then essentially what we've said is we can now break that down into in this month, say it's four weeks for your mesocycle. I'm going to have uh, three days per week or four days per week of, of strength conditioning slots available. I'm then going to decide, do I want to do two days of general stuff and three days of gymnastics? Do I want to do one day and three day? And then now we're at the level that, okay, we're looking down the barrel of an actual Monday to Friday week. Is, is when we take the next step, which is like, what are we going to program to actually make it beneficial, which we'll talk about specifically next. But is there anything kind of above that line from like the year to the sub year to like the, the month to like the, the days per week that you feel is, is also important to touch on? I mean, I just think so. So far, we've kind of talked about the general preparation phase, which is sort of that first, yeah. you know, getting back to training and then, you know, leading up to that, you know, maybe the first larger ish competition of the season is usually when I'll, I'll start to to um, ramp things up in terms of, of more speed and power work. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe we're lifting like moderately heavy weights uh, quickly with the goal of, you know, expressing power with a bit of force or express, expressing speed with a bit of force behind it. So we might be doing more sled sprints and we might be doing like trap bar jumps or, or uh, dumbbell jump type type stuff in that. Um, those phases, like the, the, the second mesocycle, you're kind of competition one. But again, it's 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 leading to our first competition and that's uh, a much usually a, a, a smaller event uh, after that kind of moderately heavy load uh, type um, type power phase i'll usually transition into a body weight mostly body weight lightweight um, explosive uh, phase leading up to that first competition um, i think if i was going to continue to stay on this kind of level it, the 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 three months or the period leading up to that major competition, it's going to depend a little bit on the athlete and where I think mm -hmm. their like relative deficits lie. Mm -hmm. um, if if I feel like strength is something that they need to work on, I'll usually. So in, now we're picturing the very last phase, that yep. kind of three months leading up to the competition. I might hit like one moderate strength type phase. So four weeks of, of getting back to strength because we've kind of been away from it now for maybe three months. Um, doing our, our, you know, more specific prep type stuff. Yep. I might then hit um, kind of a contrast or a mixed phase of like some moderate load power mixed with light load power. So you can picture like some some dumbbell jumps mixed in with body weight jumps as, yep. as our strength conditioning specific stuff. And then that last phase uh, leading up to the, the peak competition of the year, it's going to mainly be again, light um, body weight explosive, um, you know, kind of priming stuff to get ready for that, uh, that peak event. That's usually the way that I guess I would look at it. And I think I've kind of described the whole, yeah. <laughs> the whole year if, as, as much as I can verbally. Yeah, no, it's great. And I think that what you're doing here is help paint a picture of, you know, during this entire year, we're, we're working all qualities of athleticism, right? We need to work strength. We need a little, a little bit of power, a little bit of like gymnastics specific stuff, but essentially we're going to skew that into maybe what the most important bucket is of that, that three month chunk. And so I can kind of give the, again, the American translation here, which is like in the off season, of course, we're working skills and we're working individual drills to get things in the gym, but this is really our opportunity to get the athletes much, much stronger and maybe have some, uh, some wiggle room to be a little sore and be a little tired because there's no meets going on. So we can kind of put some more into the bucket of strength. So that is kind of when we're doing our two days of lifting our other two days of hard gymnastics, whether it's circuits or stuff like that, because you know, you have some wiggle room to, to make people a little tired and you're not going to, you know, no one's doing full routines. That's possibly riskier, but that's like in the off season. But like you said, as you move into that preseason bucket, you're kind of blurring that line between continuing to do some maximal strength work, but also now you're really working the power the speed. You're trying to get, you know, the athlete to move very, very fast. And, and personally, as we'll get more into programming is like, I find that's an amazing opportunity for, like you said, dumbbell jumps and med balls and splint, uh, sled work, right? And like very light loads moved fast. Not that we'll go into like the actual dorky reason for why that might get that adaptation, but it's a safe way for an athlete to really express their power. And I find that sometimes what happens is that the, the, uh, 
the tool to express power is the sport itself of like, we're going to tumble really hard, right? Or we're going to swing really hard or vault really hard. And there's definitely value in that. But like, man, that's definitely blurring a risky line when someone's tissue tolerance is not ready for hard landings or stuff, but med balls and sleds and jumps, like it's very hard to hurt yourself um, doing those apparatus, but you can safely slam a ball as hard as you can, right? Or bike sprint until you feel like you're going to die. Like that's a really good way to get that, uh, that bucket of power open without like really risking too much. And then, like you said, as you move more into the actual competition, you're still trying to maintain stuff, but you're generally going out and doing sports and you're doing gymnastics and doing routines. So you don't really have that same wiggle room you had in the summer. Is that, um, I guess in line with what you think too, as well. I, w I would say for sure. I think that, you know, especially with athletes that have multiple years of, uh, of training under their belt that, you know, tr continuing the, 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 routine of, of going to the weight room whether it's once a week maybe in the in the in season like in the yep. weeks leading up to a competition um is it is important and can be pretty useful for for them uh, maybe for younger athletes it's maybe better to get most of that speed power stuff out of the uh out of their gymnastic specific training but i think that there's a there's a, a a little bit of a mixture that can be happening but i think if you kind of picture a um picture a funnel essentially of what you're doing uh you know in the in the off in the early off season it's much more of a mixed or maybe even a little bit more towards the strength conditioning side to um and then when it comes to the competition season obviously you are looking at way more gymnastic specific training and you're and you're tapering off of the stuff yeah. in the weight room or, or the stuff outside to really focus on what you're doing in the gym yeah, and to double click on that idea, because I get a lot of questions about the in season work, you know, I think off season and preseason stuff makes sense. But a lot of people, whether it's the collegiate programs I consult with or club training programs, they kind of ask like, well, what should we do in the year? Should we still keep one day per week? Or should we abandon it and kind of move on? And I think there's two scenarios in my head, which is if you have athletes that are maybe uh, they understand the role of that one day to kind of top end power or top end strength, and they do it with high intensity, and they're really focused. But also you have either a, a team that communicates well, and they understand it's not going to be the same, you know, really intense stuff from the summer. I also recommend that people add in a lot of that like maintenance care prehab work, PTAT work, it just doesn't seem to have time and season. If you can create a day that gets that good power bucket and that maintenance of that high, high threshold stuff with safety, but also fills in all the extra stuff that you don't have time for, it's, it's amazing. It's really great to have the athletes do that. But if it's like, uh, you know, going to be a, a not effective use of time and the athletes are a little bit younger, they don't have many hours in the gym and you have to get to the actual events. I think it's probably better to maybe just shelf that and just mix that into maybe some of the warm up or some other things. And that's my experience, but I'm not sure if you have the same. I mean, obviously you work with really high level athletes that might have the first option more available to them. Yeah, I will. I'll be totally honest. The with the with Ellie and Danelle, for sure, the, you know, our last lift was probably 10 days before Worlds and we like lifted some stuff yeah. <laughs> but uh you know that, that again that's a that's a much higher training age and that's a much yeah. uh m different scenario than a you know a 13 year old who this is their first season where they started lifting um sure. i think that that's a much safer um approach to it is to you know y you've got a long career ahead of you you don't, you don't have mm. to be doing these types of things um right leading up you know multiple days a week leading up to uh to major events i think that uh, what you described just now with uh is probably the best the best way to go for those those younger um compulsory type athletes yeah i dig it so i think we've we've successfully kind of covered the big picture you know painting that large uh framework and i think to provide some more value for listeners before we transition is i'd like to just maybe get a little bit more nitty-gritty and specific of like so say we're in the off season and say we have two days we have i don't know 30 minutes 45 minutes where we can play around with someone who's like you know what i listen to these these dorks on a podcast and they seem like they're really smart and i want to you know either get my hat in the ring and, and learn some of this stuff or I want to hire a strength coach, you know, like what's the most effective use of my time. Right. And, and I think this is where it gets down to just understanding basic movement patterns of the lower body and upper body and how like the, the exercise selection is helpful, but then also we can talk a little bit about just like sets and reps, just so at a basic level, somebody can understand that. So I have my thoughts on programming, but I'd obviously love to hear from you first about like, you, you get 45 minutes with a, a, a high school age, 16 year old who's going to lift for the first time in gymnastics. They're a, average level they're not super high level but they're definitely not you know like barely starting gymnastics like pretty good blank canvas to work with like what are you what are you going to do to effectively use that time maybe lower body and upper body yes good question so i'm going to so this is assuming i've you know myself and maybe a physio or myself yep. and athletic therapist yep. have 
I've communicated. Everything's good. You have unlimited go. uh, tools can, to use. You, you've invested yeah. kettlebells and dumbbells and barbells. Let's put that theory yeah. out there. You're not in a barn somewhere. <laughs> so, you mean we're not training uh, Rocky and, and Ivan Drago? And, <laughs> That's no. it. Yeah. We're going to build them out of concrete and buckets. <laughs> no. So, I mean, I, I'll, I, with this 16 year old, I know what I want to get to. You know, I want to get to speed, power, strength um, yep. eventually. So, I'm going to start with the, you know, the, the building blocks of, of speed so the building blocks of speed for me is technique usually mm -hmm. so i'm going to start with some really technical um you know drills that are really easy to do kind of anywhere all you need is maybe a wall and a yep. floor <laughs> so you know i the, the the two that come to mind that i use really often are if, if you've seen like wall drills where you're kind of um hands are on a wall 45 degree angle heels are maybe just off the off the ground and you're essentially having a, a 45 degree angle plank where you're trying to push the wall down, but you lift one leg up in kind of a, you know, you can imagine that kind of sprint start position. Um, that would be one of the things that I would start with in terms of my building blocks for speed and holding that position for 15, 20, 30 seconds uh, where you're really trying to put, and again, when I'm saying 15, 20, 30 seconds, that's like my progression over the, over the month, probably um, where you're trying to push the wall down in a, in a split stance, like a, like a first step of a sprint um, position. <laughs> yeah, there Scott, you go. Scott did not ask me to pull this up, but I'm just trying to get any frame of reference from our YouTube channel. But so it's something it's a, along these lines, right? So then so, you, you know, you can start with that as, as your building block for speed. Um, you can progress over the first couple of months to, you know, quick switches where you're now holding your you're trying to hold your pelvis steady while you're in that acceleration position. So I would be even a little bit more leaned over than than in that uh, than that mm -hmm. video, but that's OK. Um, so that's that's what I'm doing for speed. If that's my my building block. Uh, my building block for power is usually landing, to be honest. Mm. Like when I say power, like more like plyos, if you're thinking about plyometrics as a thing that you want to do, you want to yep. be able to do really high level plyometrics. We're going to work on landing mechanics. So we're probably going to drop off a box, 12 inches or 18 inch box, and just kind of catch ourselves in a, in a, a medium kind of squat position to, to teach and, and look at how we're landing. So, you know, is our shoulders over knees, um, are our knees caving are our knees right over top of our toes like that sort of stuff so we're gonna do do some of those and maybe some some box uh, seated box jumps where we're starting from a from a seated position and jumping exactly like that perfect I'm quick um, on the gun here you're, va you're fast listening in audio I'm pulling these up on YouTube as Scott is doing it so trying to help out our <laughs> listeners yeah so you know and then we're gonna from that box that we're dropping off of we might just practice jumping so then thinking about triple extension so teaching um, you know, ankles, knees, hip extension for a jump. So we're getting really tall every time we're jumping uh, from a static seated position where we can't use any counter movement. We can't cheat at all. We've just got to go, you know, go from that slack position at the bottom. So that's going to be my, my initial building block for, for plyos or for, for power, I guess, if we, <laughs> if we go um, with that. Uh, and then the next piece that I want to do from a strength standpoint is I want to start to teach the, um, the, you know, the big movement patterns that we've, talked about a ton of times whether that you know from a lower body standpoint that's going to be squatting patterns and deadlift or, or hip hinge patterns you know usually once I get to the point of loading it's probably going to be a goblet squat to be honest so that's going to be my squat pattern that I'm going to use and I'll probably use a, I'll probably use a dowel uh, deadlift to start with you know before we start loading but then maybe a I'm throwing you off with these exercises if I'm not helping just, let me know no it's good it's actually it's just impressive that you're pulling them up so fast so that's why <laughs> <laughs> um, and, it, you know, deadlifting or hip hinging patterns, we're probably going to do maybe a two dumbbell or maybe even a single kettlebell um, deadlift where they're going to learn to shift their hips back to the wall behind them. And um, and we're going to, you know, start to learn that movement pattern as well. Um, and that those are both bilateral versions. Uh, we probably would do some some sp split pelvis or, or unilateral versions, which would be probably a split squat of some sort or a reverse lunge. Exactly. And from a from a, a from a hip hinge pattern, it would be like a single leg Romanian deadlift or something along those lines, where we're we're learning to um, again still use a hip hinge pattern, but only on one side. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> uh, so from there, you know, we're going to move into upper body pressing and pulling. Again, for for gymnasts, I'm not a huge fan of barbells when it comes to upper bodies. I don't really like to fix their scapula mm. in one spot, um, which you know, whether I that's right or wrong. I don't really know. But I, I, when I do upper body um, movements, I usually start to be honest with 16 year olds who haven't really maybe been in the gym before with like tempo pushups. Mm. And we're going to, you know, we're going to build 
um, capacity in, in a pushing movement with uh, with tempo. So it's going to be maybe a three, two, one push up uh, for six or, or eight or ten reps, depending on on their capacity. And we're going to go nice and slow on the way down, pause a little bit, and then come back up. So that's going to be body weight based for pushing. Um, the next step for me there is usually some sort of uh, bar uh, dumbbell press, whether we're on a flat bench or maybe a slightly inclined bench. Um, both arms at the same time, dumbbell pressing, and again, just you know, loading some some strength there. And again, this is our our initial off season phase, so we're not into any power type stuff yet. Uh, from a pulling standpoint, I'm often sorry, an upper body pull standpoint. I'm going to look at some body weight stuff as well, like maybe a TRX row or a mm. or, or a bar row, which again, in the gymnastics setting, you can do uh, with a block with a um, a block and, and uneven bars or bar. Um, and we're just going to look at really quality of, of scapular movement. Like what are the, what are the shoulder blades doing? Um, what are, what's the head of the humerus or what's like that, you know, the, your, the front of your shoulder doing while you're pulling and pressing. Those are two things that I see, especially with younger gymnasts, um, being a bit of an issue where, you know, you get that like big bulge in the front, they can't control the, the kind of front aspect of their, of their shoulder. Um, so we're going to, cue that and like build capacity in, in staying in a good position while still letting your scapula move around uh, mm. the rib cage while they're moving. And then it's usually, <laughs> so one more, and it, that's, that's usually going to be some torso type stuff. So again, gymnastics athletes are really good. And I think I've heard you just talk about this a ton, uh, you know, doing, you know, crunches, bicycles, you know, really mo dynamic movement, hollow body based stuff, mm -hmm. but maybe they haven't done a ton of um, static um, torso stuff or like loaded static torso things or anti right. anti rotation anti flexion anti extension type stuff so we'll we'll work on glute bridges um, like plank variations and usually at some sort of anti rotation press uh, like a like a like a paloff standing paloff press and those are some of the things that will that will be involved in pro in programs for the first you know 12 to 16 weeks um, that will progress you know from lighter loads yeah so there's our a, a, an example of a single leg hip lift um or glute bridge as, as i think i called it mm -hmm. and you know we're we'll start again lighter higher reps and we'll progress over those first three months like we described earlier to um heavier lower uh reps and it's not necessarily that we're going to drastically change the exercises like maybe we'll go from a goblet squat to a front or back squat potentially depending on the over those over those few months mm -hmm. but you can you can get a ton of adaptation with a progressive overload with the same exercises for that period of time especially with someone who's relatively new to the gym well that was fun that was wonderful <laughs> i feel like i was just like the dj for scott wilgris right there at his like breakout party that was amazing um, that was fun. yeah so that was really cool to kind of like hear you actively think in real time about it. And I think if I could kind of um, summarize a lot of what you said is like kind of like you can look at the body. So again, we're talking about the two uh, lifting days, right? So like you've committed to two days in an off season of doing weight training, general training. And then when you look inside that bucket, when you look down a program, and I think, you know, if you were to look at a champion program versus yours versus like, you know, Boyle or Cressy, somebody like a lot of these really popular strength coaches, you generally see all your warm up and soft tissue stuff. But then you see some like reaction and or power work, which is what you described as like sprinting or power or jumping. Like you want to do that when they're fresh because they're, they're neurally ready to rumble. So anything you want to teach on sprinting or jumping or things like that, they go in the beginning and then you move your way down more into like the actual strength bucket. And that's kind of where we're talking about getting all these main movement patterns to split up into maybe, you know, two different days that are counterbalancing to each other. So in the lower body, like you had said, we have the squat, we have the hinge, we have maybe a split pelvis position and a single leg, right? To keep it really basic. We would have the squat on the first day, the hinge on the second day, we'd have the split pelvis on the first day, we'd have the single leg on the second day, right? And then even within that, so now we have lower body for the upper body, you described four patterns of pushing and pulling, maybe pushing in the horizontal, like a push up, rowing towards your face, like a, a row or a dumbbell row or a face pull and you described a little bit of like you know uh, up and down variations but usually gymnasts get a lot of pull-ups and handstand push-ups so i also see that too that you don't always program as much but if you wanted to program completely maybe a landmine press overhead in the vertical department maybe some sort of a cable pull down would be a good option so now you have lower bodies right as your a movements as described you have upper body as your b movements and you just described like filling in some core and or accessory work which is the anti-movements right so you have anti-flexion you have anti-extension 
rotation, anti-rotation, anti-side bending. And those things could be, you know, uh, a dead bug, a bird dog, a suitcase carry march, a plank drag through, an anti-rotation press out. But essentially you're filling in basic movements to film two triplets, right? An A, a B, and a C, which is like a lower body, an upper body, and a core, and then another A and a B and a C. That alone, if you just did a warm up and some good speed and agility work and a solid, you know, power uh, block, and then some strength movements, you'd have a phenomenal program for the average new gymnast. And you could very easily get a massive training effect just from that. Learn those basic 10 movements we just talked about and you, you'd crush, I think. Absolutely. I think, and I think it's key too that you're, you know, to have those, those speed and power type of, type of things um, in there all the time. So they're, they're happening at all times in the program. Um, it's just the, you know, the intensity or the type of it progresses to much more what you know you would normally think of as speed or like sprinting or right. or jumping or plyometrics much later in the pro in the process and that's the same thing with the with the strength stuff i think exactly what you said if you've got an abc and then another abc that's like you know your lower body upper body core lower body upper body core um you can take essentially the a very similar program that we're describing right now vary it even if it's only by the load <laughs> that you like progressively mm -hmm. overload it for 12 weeks where you know the first few weeks it's like relatively high reps the middle weeks it's moderate reps and then the last weeks uh last four weeks it's um it's lower reps and higher you know now you can lift heavier stuff you know you're going to get a huge huge benefit in the in those in that three week period and or three month period sorry and you're going to be amazed at what uh, the, the skills you're going to be able to add to the gymnastics uh, uh program coming up in that next uh, that next phase yeah, and I think this is a good, again, Scott and I did not plan this, but I just happen to have um, one of our college athletes programs who has been with us for a while. But for those looking on YouTube, it essentially is what Scott and I just uh, outlined. And she's given us permission to use this because she's been with us for a while and she's cool. But essentially, you see exactly what Scott and I just outlined, right? Which is on, you know, there's two days here. We have a, an A day and a B day. And we have essentially what we call a warm up or a ramp program followed by some reaction and power work. So she has some med ball work, some seated jumps. Some, uh, some pogo hops, some some core activation, and then follow down here below in the resistance training, you see the squat shows up on this side, and then the other day would be a hinge, which for her was a trap bar deadlift. And then you also see some single leg hip lifts like Scott was talking about. We have some split squats on the other day. So you see how we've filled in these movement patterns kind of across two days, but then we also see some upper body work, some core work. Um, and then for her, uh, I, as the physical therapist, put in some like, you know, accessory work down here, which is like just some some cuff work for an old, uh, she had a slap tear back in high school. And then uh, down here, some calf work for some Achilles issues she was going through. But this is like literally what she did for, uh, the first four weeks of her cycle and this was in her off season when she came back from college so without even showing scott this i'm sure if we compared programs it'd be 80 percent of it would be kind of there and then our own flavor based on what the athlete needs and what we think is useful you know i'm laughing here in the in on in my desk because like if you looked at what ellie did this week it's so similar um and it, this is basically the, uh, the equivalent i guess it's the this is we're in the second meso cycle now for off season worlds were really really late this year so we really got one measles cycle leading up to christmas after a break after worlds and that kind of stuff and now this is our second one and uh yeah what you're describing here is essentially it's really similar and like even our our final pairing is mostly physio based exercises that you know her her physio martha purdy and i um kind of collaborate on and i send videos of that stuff to her like every day so nice. that she can see it correct it give me other ideas and things like that places to go directions to go but yeah, it, I mean, it's it's really this simple, <laughs> which is funny yeah. to say, but it's not. Yeah, it's you know it's not rocket science, but it uh, you know it's it's pretty pretty interesting. It's it's funny too. I feel like our brains um, are somehow very connected, even though we met you know, only a couple of years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, unfortunately, we had eight years of, of, of error and screwing things up and working our way up <laughs> yeah. to figure out what worked before we got to here. So, yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. So the one point I do want to mention here is everyone listening here is probably very much a gymnastics coach or involved, which is like these would be the two days. The other days would be all the fun stuff that you could possibly imagine would be in there. Cast handstands, rope climbs, handstand push-ups, leg lifts, like all the things that you know you do probably every day already. It would be the other two days just in an organized fashion. For some people, that's circuits. That's a time circuit where you do X of whatever and you move on per minute. For some people, uh, that is a, a list of things to do in a binder and you have your handstands, your rope climbs, your, you know, all that kind of stuff. You would still have another two days of a four day of a 45 minute program. And if you were with younger athletes here, you would only have one of these days that got the biggest low hanging fruit and the other day would be all that gymnastics. So I've worked with athletes and I've, I've made these programs for two day per week, compulsory level gymnasts or optional, uh, moving up to optional or recreational or Excel. 
and, and they do just fine with it. They love it. They have one day they work hard in the in general stuff. They have one day where they do more of their gymnastic stuff, but every warm up has some lines from Nick Ruddick and some daily dozen stuff and then some event side stations for other extra bonus stuff. So you can easily do this if your athletes are only in the gym six days per week and you have 30 minutes to do conditioning on each day. It's totally viable. So I wanted to point that out. And I think, Scott, the last thing I want to touch on here before we we transition and kind of move away is um, I just want to kind of touch upon like why we're picking in this example, it's it's three it's three sets of six repetitions for this goblet squat, which means she's doing four sets total, one warm up set and then three actual working sets. So like why why are we picking in an off season here, you know, three to four sets of six versus five sets of 12? Like what's the difference there? Yeah, so I mean, the the um, set rep scheme that you have here, I would consider that to be kind of like a strength, either a strength building or strength maintenance right. type yep. of a type of a um, uh, of a rep, set rep scheme versus you know that five by twelve is a lot of volume. It's high. It's high reps. I wouldn't um, wish that on my worst enemy. <laughs> yeah, so you're going to be tired. You're probably going to be sore. And you know, depending on what uh, the situation is with the athlete that you're working with, you know, that's going to be really conducive to building muscle mass and again mm -hmm. I, I talked earlier about you know i'm i'm not afraid of muscle mass yeah um some people might be but you know that's it's just something that you'd have to keep an eye on and understand that that's potentially a side effect as long as the athletes you know are uh, and uh, are you know fueling well and all that kind of stuff and recovering mm -hmm. well it's it's not going to be a big deal and especially with this like one to two day a week um yeah. set up you know they're not in the gym they're not in the weight room doing this six days a week which is you know kind of that bodybuilder style yeah. of uh training so you know as a as an aside but yeah. back to the, the main point yeah like you know here this six to eight rep range it's a, it's enough to get a strength it's enough load to get a strength benefit it's enough volume to maintain some strength and maybe maintain some some muscle mass with this two day a week split but it's not so much that they're going to be super sore um, not be able to, you know, do their gymnastics uh, st um, work the next day. And it's, it's you know, it's going to be um, kind of that minim minimum effective dose, I guess, is the best way to put it. Yep, absolutely. And then I'll, I'll summarize this point before we're going to move on and kind of wrap things up here, which is you'll see here in the reaction and power stuff, right, that two sets of four, right, is very different than a four sets of eight. And the reason that is, is because when you have some ask someone to do a med ball slam or a jump or something like that, like you're looking for like top end intensity, like max effort. And there's the conversation around, you know, full effort and intent and what that means, but also on like energy systems wise, this is very much fueled by the very fast PCR system. So you you really use up a lot of that gas in the tank when you do this. And I'd rather see somebody do four to four, eight in this uh, max effort reps and then take a healthy two, three minutes in between to get that energy system back while they do something else. That is what actually trains that specific uh, system for that, right? So like you'll see a two by four in the power work versus like we said, a, a four by six maybe or a four by eight in some of the main movements. And that's just the reason for that is because you're, you're tapping into a little bit different, uh, you know, power, top end power and speed versus, you know, a, a more strength component. Yeah, I mean, this morning the uh, power pairing that I had to, to in that exact section of Favelli's workout was was like a rock back to rotational med ball hip toss, and it was yep. uh, two sets of five each side, and with with um, mini hurdle, lateral mini hurdle jumps, um, two sets of six each side. So like we're right in. <laughs> We're right in the same ballpark for sure. Amazing. The, the benefit of reading research, right? We kind of dabble in the same areas, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. And so I don't want to make this go too long. We could, Scott and I could literally talk for five more hours about this one topic. And uh, it's a good transition because um, when this episode comes out, it's actually cool to, to share this now is that, so Scott and I, after last year's symposium, which was like super popular, uh, we are doing another symposium this year. And we try, I try to think about, you know, what would be the most benefit to the average people who are exactly on this goal line, which is like, all right, I think this is useful. I want to try to do it, but like, I am so stressed out and so intimidated and so overwhelmed of how do I actually start with one of the Excel programs. And so what uh, Scott and I have agreed to do is for the symposium this year on the third day, there's going to be three lectures. The first three lectures is we are actually going to, to hand build together a, a program from scratch, which would be for maybe, you know, it's going to depend on obviously who we pick, which we'll say here in a second, but we're going to have, you know, this is how much time I have. This is what my goals are. This is what I want to do. And we're going to do 40 minutes on an off season program. And then we're going to build one from scratch. We're going to do 40 minutes on a preseason program and 40 minutes on an in season program. And between Scott and I, not only are we going to build a, what I think 
think will be a baller uh, strength conditioning program uh, for the two days, but also I'll be able to fill in as a coach. This is what I would do in warmups. This is what I would do for your, your 10 athletes in front of you on leg lifts and press handstands and rope climbs and whatever to get your kips better or to get your jumping better. And so that's really exciting because that's, that's actually the first time we've talked about this live is that we're, we're going to team up and trying to build one from scratch. So uh, I'm kind of excited for that, man. I'm not going to lie because it, it feels like this is like our, our dress rehearsal. <laughs> yeah, oh, absolutely. And it, it worked super well today. So I'm excited to see how the real deal goes. But no, I think it's going to be really exciting. I'm excited to learn, you know, to, to get really into the weeds with you and learn a bit more from you on, on that topic. And um, yeah, it's going to be cool. Yeah. And I think it'll be cool for two reasons. One is because we obviously don't program together on a realistic basis day to day, but um, I think people will see a fluent communication between a gymnastics coach like myself who dabbles a little bit in strength conditioning and then you as a full fledged strength coach who dabbles in gymnastics coaching. And that really is where I think the, the lost bridge is not built yet in gymnastics, which is like the coach is like, how do I have that conversation with a strength coach who's local in the gym and works with sports performance people, but knows nothing about gymnastics. And then the, maybe the average strength conditioning coach can hear this and be like, okay, this is what a kip is. This is what a handstand pushup is. This is what a rope climb is. And the hope is that by giving people three hours worth of like literally just follow our advice, you can build those programs for yourself. Not that you'll take that exact, you know, program and use it, but it will help get people probably, I would say 80% of the way there on a really dope summer off of thing program, which when the symposium happens in June, you could then have a July and August program uh, getting right into the off season. But you're also going to see how we would transition to a power program in the preseason, what we would do in maintenance care in the in season. So yeah, that's really cool, man. Yeah, no, I'm excited for it. Um, yeah. And so we'll end it with this, which is uh, for those that are listening, um, you actually could be the person who we write the entire year's strength program for. So this is a really cool, exciting announcement that I want to give credit to my team for, which is we were going to just have a random gymnastics coach that we know and trust and comes on and wants to do it. But we figured a cooler value would be to actually build one for a gym out there who is in the middle of nowhere, maybe, and doesn't have the ability to get to a Scott or a, a tour or me or someone and could really benefit from getting literally programs handed up from scratch. So anyone who signs up when this podcast comes out for early bird ticket pricing, you automatically are entered to win a raffle. And if you win the raffle, Scott and I will meet with you before the symposium and we will ask how many gymnasts do you have? How much time do you have during the week? What, what problems do you have for power, for speed? What injuries do you have for me in the physio side? And you're going to actually be the person that we use and build the material for from scratch. So I don't know. I, I'm like more excited to do it now because I know that it's, it's not theoretical. It's going to really go into the hands of one awesome person for their gym and their team will get to watch us do, you know, you for, for the version of Ellie and for me, the version of all the schools I consult with. Um, that's, that's pretty dope, you know? Yeah, no, it's, it's pretty exciting and I'm excited to, uh, to see where we go with it and what we uh, come up with. Yeah, you got it. So if you do want to enter that, um, early bird tickets are new, uh, now available now. If you listen to this episode after March 6, I think it is. I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize. You have missed the entry. Um, but please still do come to the symposium. Um, but yeah, so it's the 2020 through uh, 2023 shift symposium is the website. So shiftmovementscience.com backslash 2023 shift symposium is where you get your tickets. Group pricing is available. And then, um, yeah, hopefully you win. And, uh, Scott and I will be sitting on this zoom call with you, uh, probably sometime in March before the symposium. But, um, Scott, before we pass the uh, torch to the next uh, podcast guest um what would you like to maybe just share about the upcoming year you're excited about or things on your mind words of wisdom anything else on your mind oh man well this year i'm really excited because uh you know from a gymnastics strength coaching standpoint anyway the team the canadian team does not have to qualify for the olympics we, right. we pre-qualified right. which you know the are if there's any elite american listeners you, you guys are probably used to that but we're not uh so having a full year to be able to uh to be able to just train you know upgrade some stuff um you know work on strength and power and speed and bulletproofing some ankles and some shoulders and some backs um is a really exciting um a thing that I haven't had to really experience before. It's kind yeah. of always been like, let's get to the next competition. Let's get to the next competition. Let's make sure we, you know, uh, we uh, are ready to go and, and compete, you know, every other, every couple months. Um, not going to have to worry about that quite as much this year. So I'm super excited to see where we can go with not only, you know, the, the couple of um, Ellie and Danelle, the two national team members here, but with the, the broader national team group um, across, uh, across Canada. So yeah, it's a, it's going to be a pretty exciting upcoming year and I'm, I'm pretty stoked for it. That's awesome, man. I'm so happy for you. And I'm so happy for obviously all the athletes and, and the hard work you guys have put in. But um, yeah, man, it's, it's gonna be a cool year coming on the barrel between everything going on and then the symposium and stuff. So I'm really looking forward to picking a lucky winner and making our little uh, program together, but then also just watching you guys throughout the summer and beyond. So yeah, it should be fun. 
Cool, man. Well, I appreciate your time. And uh, yeah, we'll be chatting quickly here. But uh, thank you for uh, the hour now and then the three hours coming up down the road and all that kind of stuff. So uh, we appreciate always your input and your wisdom. I know the listeners have had a lot of positive feedback. So thank you. Absolutely, Dave. Thank you much, very much for having me. No problem, man. Talk to you soon.